Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us in the first installment of the Geography Webinar Series this year. This event is brought to you by the UP Department of Geography in partnership with the Philippine Geographical Society. I am Celeste Hermida, and I will be your host this afternoon. Here are a few reminders before we proceed. Kindly keep your microphones on mute during the presentation. We encourage you to interact by typing your comments and questions in the chat box. I will bring them up during the open forum at the end of the presentation. This lecture is being simultaneously streamed in the UP Department of Geography YouTube channel. Also, please note that this meeting is being recorded. The recording will be made available for viewing after the event. Our featured speaker this afternoon is Mr. Carlos Ortiz. Carlos Ortiz works as a Manila's program coordinator for Japanese studies and intellectual exchange at the Japan Foundation. He's in charge of several projects to strengthen ties between Japan and the Philippines through cultural exchange and dialogues. He earned a geography degree from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Without further ado, here is Carlos Ortiz to deliver his presentation, Japan as an Imagined Landscape and Reality, a Geographer's Checklist for Beginners. Carlos. Mute ka muna, Carlos. Yes, so good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone see my screen? Hello? Ita po. Ah, okay. So, yeah. So, konnichiwa minasan. And uh, thank you for taking an interest to join today's brown bag session. So, when Dominic asked me to talk about Japan, initially, I don't know what to talk about because I think it is impossible to cover an entire country. And uh, similar to the Philippines, Japan has many facets that would require different people and scholars to tackle them. So my work at the Japan Foundation Manila allowed me to travel to Japan pre-pandemic and uh, work on projects under Japanese studies and uh, intellectual exchange. Uh, I've been to the Tohoku area for an arts approach to disaster education. Uh, I also attended, uh, attended, I believe, was the ninth anniversary of the March 11 East Japan earthquake. And uh, another project uh, which made me visit areas and cities in Japan with a significant number of immigrants and uh, foreign workers was on migration and uh, multiculturalism. And uh, as you can see in the picture, we conducted an activity in an elementary school in Kyoto. And uh, together with me were artists, curators, NGO workers from across Asia. Uh, I think movement is a universal language that is relatable and felt across different nationalities. And uh, I'm glad that we have this witnessed by the next generation of Japanese. Um, in turn, I hope they see migrants in their home country differently now by being exposed and interacting with us. And uh, the last picture below was a visit to Tokyo University during their entrance examination. So this is their version of UPCAT. And uh, the examinees were very serious, like quite different to what we experience in UP. And uh, together with me were the winners of the Japanese Studies Research Competition. And, and this study tour to Japan is one of their prizes. So later I will promote this one for those who are interested. Now, anyway, so you were asked to write down words when you think about Japan. So those who have been there might have a grasp of the cityscape, townscape, and maybe even the smell skip is actually different from the Philippines. And uh, for those who have not yet visited the country, what we get is an image of Japan and uh, our expectations that was probably fed by us by social media or wherever we get the information from. So what is Japan? Or generally, how should we see a country as a geographer? So... Actually, I couldn't see you guys, but kindly thumbs up if you agree that these images come across in your mind when you think of Japan. So you have anime, video games, action figures, high technology, more anime, cosplay, and then the metropolitanism of it all, 
the majority of it all and the overpopulation of it all. So these are actually the modern images of Japan as fed by popular culture. And then you have the traditional image uh, we expect Japan to be. So kindly thumbs up again if you see these images come across your mind when you think of Japan. So you have the samurai, the traditional houses with sliding doors and the tami mats, women in traditional clothing walking across the town with traditional architecture, tori gates, and of course, the cherry blossom of it all. And mind you, the Sakura season only lasts for a week or two. So uh, let's manage our expectations when we think of Japan as the cherry blossom country. So the modern and traditional expectations we have of Japan are not at all wrong. They do exist, however, not in the general sense that they exist all throughout Japan. So let's call it pockets of existence. And uh, let's not expect that when we cross the street, we would encounter a person in samurai armor or every day is Sakura season. So the images we saw are a part of, the Jap uh, a part of Japan, but not the entirety of Japan. So going back, if you've been a student of um, the Department of Geography, let's go back to the nostalgic culture iceberg model. The images shown earlier is just part of the popular notions of Japan, which is only part of the surface of the iceberg around here. They are essential as part of the Japanese-ness. However, they are overly researched and or information about them is very accessible. There are still cultural attributes and elements below unseen that we can look into. And if you're interested to dive deeper as a scholar, of course, the surface is the easiest to go to and you can just slowly work your way downward. So my presentation will touch the surface first and I leave it up to you if you want to dive deeper. So I cannot tackle everything and maybe some topics might require the knowledge of more experts and would require a more critical lens. So we'll not touch those for the sake of light sharing and uh, an in, just an introductory appreciation of Japan and hopefully a future area of interest to you. So for the past two years, traveling has been restricted. So I miss traveling a lot and I'm sure you are all are. So let's make this a little fun and uh, what would and ask ourselves what would the geographer notice or should notice upon arriving in Japan. So of course, of course, let's start with the airport. So I couldn't find a photo of the arrival area of the Haneda airport. So sorry about that. So let's say you have arrived at Haneda airport. And um, don't worry because you won't get culture shock right then and there because airports are hyperspaces. So all of them look more or less the same. So it looks like Naia 3. So it's nothing really different. But this feeling of familiarity is actually short-lived because you hindi ka pa nakakalabas sa airport, you would already encounter this. So in the Philippines, upon arrival, you have different choices of modes of transport. You have the taxi, uh, rented vans, Grab, Resorts World bus. But in Japan, you have a very wide area of choices. So you have multiple buses, which are very pricey, by the way. And then you also have multiple promos of train passes, and they're all connected within the airport. So luckily, you have these ladies on the side that will assist you. But you have to make sure you know what mode you want. Because unlike me, I just wanted to go to my hotel, but apparently that's not good enough because there's so many ways to go to your hotel that you, you need to know beforehand what mode of transport you should take. But what I admire the most about here in this photo is that uh, this is really the convenience of having a well-connected well intermodal movement of people. And I hope to experience this in the Philippines within our lifetime. Like you don't have to go out to the airport premise itself just to get a cab or ride a bus, like everything. Uh, if you can see here, this is already the entrance to the train station. Yeah, so hopefully we could experience that in the Philippines within our lifetime. And yeah, so this one in the photo, you see a beautiful Western architecture. This building is actually not a mansion or a museum. It is actually one of Japan's busiest 
stations, if not the busiest. So this is Tokyo Station. And so you might wonder if it is the busiest, where are the people? So the people are actually underground. So what looks like a calm, luxurious establishment on the outside, below is a different scene. So you actually have a labyrinth below in its truest sense. So the vastness of their underground network system is really out of the expectation of someone like me from the Philippines with, with only have four train lines, diba. So this was actually overwhelming for me when I first arrived in Japan. So remember my goal earlier was just to go to my hotel. Pero how do you get out of the train station is another challenge. So I actually memorized my itinerary and I know that the exit nearest to my hotel was the north exit. So there were personnel who will help you there. And then I asked the lady, where is the north exit? And then she told me there are actually four to six north exits. So I have to specify which north exit should I exit to. So my tired self immediately thought, um, baka dito na ako matutulog sa station na to. But um, joking aside that no, the personnel was, was so kind and uh, they, he, she was so kind to assist me and my companions to the exit 30 steps away from our hotel. And she said, because it was raining and she noticed we don't have umbrella, so might as well take us to the nearest exit possible to our hotel. So just a tip for everyone, rent a pocket Wi-Fi at the airport and use Google Maps. It will save you your life, literally. And you can trust the application because it will tell you where to go, the modes of transport available, what time they arrive, and what time you should start walking and so on. So you don't need to worry about it. And as per my experience, it was 100% accurate. It was, like really, it was really like a sorcery for me that the application has that accuracy. Comparing it to the Philippines and how we use Google Maps, it's like tackling two different applications. And uh, if you are interested to do a comparative study on this, I'm really curious to know about your findings because it is as if that the Google Maps in Japan is really different from the Google Maps in the Philippines. So yeah, so yun. And uh, let's say you went to another BC area in Tokyo and this one in, on the picture is Shinjuku. So in their comprehensive plan of their city, they categorize this zone as an area for friendly exchange. But what do you mean by friendly exchange? So do we have that type of zoning category in the Philippines? Because when we were doing uh, the land use map of a city here for our field work in our department around nine years ago, uh, it was purely the conventional commercial, residential, industrial labels. But in Japan, they actually have this zone of friendly exchange. But do they mean it's the tourist area? Because it feels like it. So maybe they're just trying to laymanize some terms for people not to really think about that this area is just for tourists. So like they just call it a uh, friendly exchange zone. So however, this area is where I'm interested because also in Shinjuku, you have this type of place. So the winners of the Japanese Studies Research Competition and I were jokingly saying that this, this place is where the locals are. So I took this street view because this is where our hotel is so, uh, this is where our hotel is, so I'm familiar with the area. So you immediately notice that the roads inside the blocks are narrow. And I mean, who would need a car when the train station is just at the end of the road? And uh, you would also see how pedestrian friendly the streets are. So there's just people walking around. And the thing that I'm most interested in here is look how petite and uh, compact those buildings are. So I couldn't say they're small because this building is actually a five-story building, but it still looks petite and compact. So mind you, this is central Tokyo still. And uh, according to a uh, Nikkei Asia article, you can attribute this to the national zoning policy of Japan. And as most residential and commercial zones allow for a mixed use of the land. So as you can see on this map, the red one was where the street view was. So the, ito yung hotel namin. And despite being at the heart of urban living, you would see private and public houses existing. 
there are graveyards around and then there's an elementary school around the block and patches of open spaces and then this one the big one is the shinjuku gyoen mae park and uh, even the commercial areas are mixed in composition and uh, in front of our hotel was actually uh there's a small pharmacy and then almost every corner there's a convenience store pop up uh, convenience store and then there are pop-up restaurants wood carving shops barber shop and then there's a tea ceremony place so almost all the essential things that you need to live in a community is just around this block so everything it's it's already there uh, i mentioned how convenient uh, i mentioned the uh, how convenient stores are in every corner so as you can see in this map like immediately you'd see the labels of like popular convenience are 7-Eleven, Family Mart, Mini Stop, Lawson. So they are actually as ubiquitous as vending machines, and you can truly say that they are convenient. And uh, the, uh, the one thing that I can compare it in the Philippines is, you know, have you noticed that there are so many laundry shops popping up in Metro Manila? So I think it's like the next wave of Sari Sari stores. And I'm truly curious about this phenomenon. And if we cannot research about the Japanese elements of like the proliferation of convenience stores in Japan, why not use it as an inspiration to research ours? So like the phenomenon of like the laundry shops and sari sari stores. And uh, anyway, so uh, going back to the zoning, mixed use for me invites better living. Um, having different establishments coexisting in the same area adds to the diversity and which is actually a good indicator that people from different walks of life and uh, nationalities could coexist and this leads me to my uh, last sharing about we have this notion kasi, that japan is homogenous but uh when i was there it was truly diverse maybe in the rural areas you could say that you could say that major it's uh, the japanese are still the majority but uh, that's really hard to say if you are in the city and uh, the people working in the convenience stores actually have foreign names and they don't look um, japanese at all and in the cities i've visited uh, i've always worked and encounter a filipino so my question is why are we not seeing more of that diversity in the media when we know for a fact that japan is no longer homogenous. Japan is a multicultural uh, country, but why are we not seeing it in the media? So issues on multiculturalism is still a big uh, topic in Japan, but there are efforts now and initiatives trying to change the views of migrants and uh, foreign workers. So some Filipino scholars are doing that. And uh, maybe as geographers, we can also explore and provide a spatial perspective into that. So going back to the pictures earlier, um, Japan is all of these and more. So a Japanese study scholar has presented in one of our conventions that Japan is a country. So just like the Philippines, it has its shared advantages and uh, problems. And putting it inside a box limits its potential. So if you are interested in uh, Japanese studies, try to see it beyond the anime and the samurai, uh, they are still valid starting points, but uh, I hope you could explore even more. And hopefully when we appreciate Japan as an area of study, we in turn reflect and appreciate as well our own country. So, ayun. so the Japan Foundation Manila has a lot of events that you can attend. If you want to learn more about performing arts, visual arts, literary arts, films, dialogues, and the arts and cultural exchanges between Japan and the Philippines. So if you want to be updated, you can follow us on our Facebook page and uh, Instagram. And uh, I just want to plug that we have the final round of this year's Japanese Studies Research Competition next Saturday. So this is an event co-organized by the UP Asian Center. So uh, unfortunately, we couldn't do a study, study tour for the winners. However, they will get an iPad to help them with their online learning. So if you are interested to attend or even join in the future, details will be posted on our Facebook page. So that's it. I think we got lost in our uh, 
virtual travel to Japan. Maybe it's a metaphor of doing area studies. Sometimes we get off track. But anyhow, hopefully we have learned a thing or two about Japan. And uh, thank you for listening. Arigato gozaimashita. much Carlos um, and I hope uh, all of you have uh, enjoyed this presentation so let's go ahead and take some time for your questions and comments um, please make sure to type your questions and comments in the zoom chat box or in our social media accounts especially for those who are watching via YouTube um, any takers any questions okay, so while we give um, everyone some time to compose their questions. So I, uh, I prepared um, a question here and there's also another question coming in from YouTube. So we'll also read that. So, but first, um, Carlos, um, I'm interested to know um, while you were there, so based on your observation, so um, uh, how would you say um, Japan's landscapes have transformed over time and um, and how do these transformations kaya come to reflect how Japan is being being viewed today? That is actually a difficult question because the development in the urban and uh, rural areas are very different. So if you think about the urban setting, you would see that uh, sa mapa na pinakita ko, it's actually becoming more smaller so they don't you don't really need to go out of your block to to enjoy like the the amenities and like the services that you would need to live so i think that's that's the direction that japan is going on the urban setting but on the rural well there are a lot of issues about aging and um maybe planning or the like the landscape won't be necessary if like there were, will only be five or three people living there for the next 10 years. So mostly, actually, mostly everything is going urban. Like everyone, like the, the migration of people is going urban. However, there was a, a, an incident that because of the pandemic, people are already starting to think about going to the rural and um, start on thinking about their lives that maybe it is not necessary to live in, uh, in the urban areas. And could find meaning and uh, happiness in the rural side. So, ayun. Thank you, Carlos. Um, there's a question here from Dili Joe Ocampo. So, thank you for the talk. So, why do you think is the homogeneity taking time to reflect on popular media? Um, probably it's because of the population. Maybe they couldn't accept that the, the society is becoming more diverse and with that maybe they're try probably they're trying to to think about Japan as Japan and Japan for the Japanese so it would really take some time because I believe even the national policies don't have that effort to address this issue and yeah I don't have a concrete answer on this but this is something that Billy Joe could research on because this is an interesting topic, actually. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you, Carlos. So there's a question here coming from uh, our YouTube channel. So um, the viewer asks, um, why is Japan referred to as the land of the rising sun? Uh, okay. <laughs> well... Um, geographically speaking, Japan is really on the eastern side of of the, the world so they are the first ones to get a glimpse of the the sunrise and uh, this popular notion of the rising sun could also be attributed to their rise in economy in the early 80s like uh, post-world war so that is also another explanation why they called the rising sun great thank you um are there any more questions from the audience uh, yes, uh, Sir Joe. Hi, Carlos. Thank you for yes, your sir. wonderful talk. Um, I've been I've been to Japan only once. That was uh, probably 2018. So, and the preparations at the time for the 2020 uh, Olympics was underway. And and I just have to relate this that I I was 
we didn't know that you know a certain pandemic is gonna reassemble our lives in 2020 but i did get a few things there which i think is kind of a collector's item because it didn't happen right okay so actually this question is a very is it stems from my curiosity about as a as someone who studies film geography um would you by any chance have any insights or information about how Sofia Coppola's Lost in Translation has made an impact in Japan? Especially, it was shot in Kyoto, or at least the story unfolded in Kyoto. And, and um, for Americans, this was 2003, of course. So for Americans, it was the first time they, they a new generation is experiencing Japan from a perspective of an American filmmaker. Um, I guess did it make such a cultural impact in Japan? Not really. I don't. I don't know. Um, maybe just cur curiosity, because um, uh, I was in the states at the time and I was teaching my own class, and the students really asked me questions, as though I could answer Japanese culture for them. I, can, I of course I could not. But do you have any insights, maybe? Or kung, kung wala man, okay lang. Actually, uh, my insight would be maybe not the direct answer to this. Maybe our director, who is a film scholar, could answer you more on this. But as, as far as I could, uh, could see is that the population of Japan has a different preference. And usually their market is really a niche. And what is successful to them in Japan isn't really successful internationally and like vice versa so maybe there is somewhat a disconnect between the film itself and the preference of the population so i hope i answered that <laughs> no you did thank you i just i'm, I'm curious okay, and um thank you carlos again um so you've mentioned um spaces for friendly exchanges so there's actually a question coming from our youtube again so this one is from celsius watch on so he asks hi i'm curious on the idea of space for friendly exchanges i believe that for the philippines we can think of readoptive use of our structures how can we maximize this use to have such spaces uh, yeah uh, I'm not very well versed with the zoning of the Philippines and maybe it's more of the single use um, zoning. But however, in Japan, it's it's really a multi, um, mixed use. So even in uh, industrial, commercial or residential, you would it is still allowed to build like a bar, a hotel in that area. So maybe that's the reason why it's called uh, a zone for a friendly exchange because everything is there really like you don't have to go to BGC for the for, for the commercial and like go back to QC where you live. So I maybe it it can be something that we can look into in the Philippines and maybe uh copy if if you may, but that would take a lot of time because uh, physical structures is very difficult to 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 uh to, to change or alter yeah but i do believe when the shinjuku uh, the city government of shinjuku categorized the area as a friendly exchange it i think it really means for it's for the tourists great yeah so thank you so there's also another question here from um, Prof. Pawilin. So good day, Carlos. This is just a pretty basic uh, question. And maybe you were already able to discuss this. Um, but I am genuinely interested to know if there is really a language barrier and how did it affect your experience in Japan? For example, when um, ex engaging with the locals. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, language is a really big thing if you're going to Japan, especially if you're going there for work or for staying there long term. So uh, it's really a thing. If you don't know their language, the one of the NGOs I've worked with there in Japan, the only thing that you can offer is actually just your body. So like physical labor and whatever you think about the body. So it's really important you know the language. The, actually, they are trying to they are trying to have a program where people get be uh, 
would people get to be exposed to the English language or the international language? However, this is still a long, this is still a long way to go. And uh, if you really want to make it in Japan or to survive Japan, at least know the language. Right. Um, talagang it's important to know kahit several phrases lang when you're going to be foreign. Yeah, survival country. skills. Really survival, knows. yes. Yes, yes. Thank you, Ayan. So there's all another question. Very active yung ating YouTube channel. Oh, God. So there's another <laughs> the question up, huh? <laughs> coming from YouTube. So how about your observations of space in connection to the location of the Tokyo Imperial Palace? Making this as a central point, would you think that the traditional notions of space becomes relevant? Uh, the Imperial Palace is actually in, at the heart of, the, of Tokyo. So if you see the picture of the Tokyo Station earlier, behind that is already the Imperial Palace. And I'm not sure if there is an, an active or like a conscious um, decision amongst the policymakers or like the planners to have the development around that, but uh, I believe they're try they they don't really think about it more so. Like just the land itself is very valuable in Japan. So even like proximity wise outside like the Imperial Palace or wherever like other Imperial Palaces are, like it 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 does it's not really significant, I think, at least for me. It just so happened that, yeah, the, the Imperial Palace is at the heart of Tokyo itself. <laughs> but it's not necessary that the development is revolving around the Imperial Palace because, like, urban sprawling is still evident in Tokyo itself. Right. Yeah, so very interesting talaga yung, um, yung talk about landscapes in Tokyo and uh, in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> kaya um, the questions coming in are actually has to do with the landscapes and also with zoning. Mm -hmm. So there's another question here about zoning. So um, I can't help but notice that the, the streets are very clean, at least with the Google Street View. Uh, photos that you've shown. So are there street vendors in... Um, in Tokyo or where you um, in the places that you visited. So here in Manila, street vendors are disciplined from approaching major thoroughfares. So Billy is asking if you've noticed some street vendors na nadun sa um, major thoroughfares in Tokyo or in the places that you've been to in Japan. Uh, by street vendors, uh, he meant that there's a vendor on the sidewalk itself. Because there, there are actually establishments that you know that expands their their uh, their products along the side sidewalks, but I I think that's a different different definition of street vendor. So if that definition of street vendor is the one that we see in the Philippines, you could hardly see. There's I think there isn't really any, and they will be immediately apprehended by the authorities if there is any because it disrupts public peace because the sidewalk is intended for the pedestrian and not for commercial use. And uh, when uh, the, the street view that I showed is actually relatively clean, but however, when you go to like Shibuya, you could actually see some small trash like uh, cigarette butts. So it's not 100% clean, but it's cleaner than what we have here, than the streets here in the Philippines. Great. Uh, thank you, Carlos. And so are there any more questions? All right. I think we've covered all questions for today. So um, thank you again, Carlos. And thank you, everyone, for your questions thank and you. comments. So now to show our appreciation, um, the Department of Geography would like to give this certificate of appreciation to Carlos. And so let me just read the content. So this certificate of appreciation is presented to Carlos Ortiz for the valuable insights and expertise shared as a virtual resource speaker for his talk, Japan, as an imagined landscape and reality, a geographer's checklist for beginners. Given this 12th of March, 2022, 
signed by Professor Joseph Fallis, the Chair of the Department of Geography, and Professor Dominic Sasha Amorsolo, the Coordinator of the Geography Webinar Colloquium Series. So thank you once again, you. Carlos, you. for sharing your uh, research and your um, presentation with us today. And uh, so uh, now I would like to call uh, Professor Joseph Pallis for a brief synthesis of the lecture and for some announcements. Thank you, Mom Celeste. Thank you, Carlos, especially for, for giving us a glimpse of Japan. Um, it would have been uh, interesting also to actually check later on who among the people in the audience have been to Japan before. It might, it might you know, it might also change the way uh, Japan is perceived. But uh, like I said, thank you very much for that. Um, the title of your talk, A Geographer's Checklist for Beginners, totally and satisfactorily, very satisfactorily uh, covered what you wanted to, uh, to cover for this one. And uh, for someone like me who've been to Japan once only, um, I, I, I was struck by the idea of how Japan also created an image uh, for itself for other people to see and, and how closely it mirrors that image in for real. I, I although I stayed in Kyoto much more than in Tokyo, um, it was it was a wonderful experience, not just from a touristic perspective, because as a traveler, like many of us are who are, I would say, enlightened travelers, we tend towards uh, a more engage, a, a more engaged um, uh, interaction with the locals. Um, of course, the locals here is, is perceived as, as uh, highly subjective, of course, but, but also uh, the products uh, and, and industries that we encounter there and, and how it also reflects uh, our own identity based on this engagement. So I really appreciate that. And also um, uh, uh, the questions about the landscapes are pretty much on point because it tells you about the differences of, uh, of um, how Japan managed to look at, or take care, maybe is more appropriate term, uh, of their landscapes in relation to, to you know, to, to, to how they, they create the image of the country itself. You know? so, so thank you for giving us a taste of Japan. And, and hopefully many of us could get a chance to visit that, that um, um, country in the, in the near future, especially now that travel has also is that so um thank you very much and i guess i would i could say this that if you can probably put your email in the chat box that would be appreciated in case there are people who might be interested to look at um opportunities for intercultural exchange as well as occasional fellowships that would that would deepen or heighten their appreciation of japan especially uh from the philippines perspective that would be great Okay, so there you have it in in the um, in the chat box. So so thank you very much, Carlos. Um, at this point, I'd like to mention that aside from this talk uh, for the month of March, we have two more uh, speakers coming up. One is Maria Karines Alejandria, a PhD in anthropology here in UP, currently teaching at the University of Santo Tomas, who's going to give us a talk next Friday. This next week uh, entitled Charting Subaltern Foodscapes, Situating Hunger in an Estuarial uh, Community. So um, it's based on her various research engagements, both locally and abroad. And also speaking of abroad, a Turkish uh, physical geographer is going to come here in the Philippines in the last week of March, and we invite you to attend his talk, Adam Yulo from Igder University. Um, in Turkey is, is going to talk about mountain tourism, the case of Mount Ararat. So it should be an interesting perspective uh, coming from, from uh, uh, someone who has been immersed in the area. It's at 4.30 p.m. on a Monday. And we have, of course, in April as well as in May, but we're going to talk more about that. So, um, and uh, all of our webinars uh, are streamed by the UPD. Diliman Department of Geography, look for it on YouTube and you will see um, other lectures that we, we post there uh, that are recorded. So, um, so there. And um, I guess that's pretty much it. I bring it back to 
Ma'am Celeste to um, conclude this uh, event. All right, thank you, Pooja Joe. So before we end this online meeting, uh, we would like to request